So we've heard about the grassroots activism, making sure that as volunteers we're organized locally and at the state level as CPI does. We've heard about the uh, many, many streams or rivers, I loved that analogy, uh, uh, about the streams of money that flow to make the elections uh, tick and sometimes not tick in this country. And then we've just heard about the litigation efforts that are going on um, throughout America. The fourth pillar in the discussion is legislation. And the fight to secure our elections um, through legislation began in earnest after the 2020 election, but it actually had been going on much longer. It's just that people really didn't pay attention. They didn't even realize that the state of Georgia, for instance, had over two dozen times non-ceremoniously passed election integrity laws in Atlanta. They didn't know that state capitals, like in Texas and Arizona, uh, had been doing the same and really with very little fanfare. But after 2020, everything changed and the state election law fight uh, went under a microscope and it became the clarion call for what would be now the woke left movement and it was its first target. So as conservative activists, and certainly at, as our work at Heritage Action, what we wanted to do at the beginning of January 2021 is set up, set up for a two-prong approach to help secure elections legislatively. First, we wanted to block the federal overreach. Uh, Christian mentioned HR1. That was our number one goal. Uh, this Congress was to ensure that HR1 S1 never made its way to President Biden's desk. More on that in a minute. And then the second part of our two-prong approach were to tackle these state-based reforms that were now beginning to move through state capitals across the country. So at the first part of 2021, if you all remember, uh, Chuck Schumer came out and he said, the most important thing we as Democrats are going to do is to pass H.R. 1. And this bill was, how many pages was it by the end of it? 800 and... Yeah, 800 and something um, long pages of a monstrosity of a huge federal takeover. It would essentially move our elections away from states and put them entirely in the hands of federal bureaucrats in Washington. Now, you can imagine in 800 pages, there were a lot of things that should never have been in there, including changes to um, election financing and campaign financing rules. Um, a change, Christian mentioned changing the voting age down to 17. Um, also, it would strip every single uh, state-based voter ID law that was already on the books across the country. So not only was it important to fight the bill and oppose Biden's federal takeover on the, the merits of the bill, the policy of the bill, but it also became important because of the politics that were at stake. If you think of a split screen, what you had all last year was you had Democrats in Washington fighting to pass H.R. 1, which would take the power away from the American people and how elections are ran and put it in the hands of bureaucrats. And then you had state lawmakers that were trying to do right by the citizens, by the voters in their state to secure the election. They were trying to clamp down on ballot harvesting, ensure that drop boxes were protected and secure, make sure that you didn't have an election season where you had six months of voting, that you instead had a very small window for early voting, and then election day counted counting ended on election day. These were just a list uh, at the end of the day, I think Hans ended up publishing 16 different reforms that states were grappling during this time. And so as Washington tried to barrel through and pass H.R. 1, these states were passing reforms in an effort to make things better and allow it to be easier to vote and harder to cheat at the state level. Well, when you had Georgia, which was, as we all know the story, and I think we all lived it last year, when the Georgia election integrity bill passed and Governor Kemp was readying to sign it, a fire was lit throughout the country because you then had a reason for the, for the liberal base in Washington to say, see, this is why we need H.R. 1 to pass. This is why we need to break the filibuster and, and pass this bill because we have crazy, radical racists that are in places like Atlanta, Georgia, that are trying to suppress the vote. That couldn't be further from the truth. As soon as Governor Kemp signed the bill, uh, there was quickly a, a rush of aid to his, uh, to his side to show exactly what was in the bill, how it wasn't voter suppression, and that the talking points that the Biden and Harris regime had sent out through all of their media markets around the country were flat out false. And over time, we won the fight 
within in front of the American people to show that you can actually have election integrity reforms that do two things at the same time. They make it easy to vote. We want people to vote. Let me just state that on the record for all of the reporters in the room. We want American citizens lawfully here to vote. We don't want it easy for them to cheat. We don't want anyone to cheat on the right or the left, period. We want a system that is safeguarded so that you can have faith when you go to the ballot that your vote counts and that it is not watered down by, by fraudsters uh, who are trying to cheat the system. So fast forward through all of last year, you had Georgia, then you had Arizona, you had Florida, you had Texas, all of these great bills uh, began to move, but this effort in Washington never went away. It kept trying to bring back HR1, trying to resurface different iterations of it. And over the last year, that is what we have been earnestly trying to hold back uh, and to fight against to show that there's, there's absolutely no need for a federal takeover of our elections because states are doing just fine taking care of election laws at the state level. So where are we today? Well, we are heading uh, 50 some odd days into the November election. Uh, you have uh, 10 more states this year that pass big election integrity bills on top of the states from last year. Elections are more secure than they've ever been, but there's obviously going to be fraud. We know that there will be fraud because man and woman are, uh, uh, well, sinners, uh, and they will, they will do bad things. We know that will happen. Um, it's expected, but there can still be this legislative uh, push to continue to protect our elections at the state level. So I feel much more confident and comfortable that our elections this November will have oversight. They'll have citizens in the room serving as poll watchers and poll workers. They'll have expert lawyers on the back end making sure that the votes were legally counted and that there wasn't mischievous bad doing because the conservative movement is awake. They know exactly what's at stake when it comes to our elections. All of these policies that we have talked about over the last three days, none of them have a shot of actually changing America if we don't have the bedrock of America, our elections, secure. So there's a direct line if you are a pro-life activist, if you are a uh, pro-American energy activist, if you want to cut taxes, if you want to support the family, if you want a strong founder's view of national defense, whatever your issue is, it all goes back to having the bedrock of our American principles of election integrity. And that's why it's something we have to fight for. We have to stay vigilant to continue to oppose HR1 and whatever iteration or form it might come back on. And we have to stay uh, diligent at the state level, working with state lawmakers, uh, encouraging them to pass these reforms, and to go back to where election integrity was a sleepy subject that only Christian Adams and Hans von Sikowski paid attention to. Because 10 years ago, they were the only ones on this panel, I guarantee you that. Well, although, though, Scott, you were fighting the good fight elsewhere, so I don't mean to take you out. But I'm new because I'm new to this fight over the last two years because we had to get in it. We had to put larger muscle behind it if we were ever going to have the policy victories that we wanted to see in state capitals uh, and in Washington. So the last point I'll, I'll, I'll make, and then I'll turn it back to Hans, and I think we'll take a couple of questions, is at the end of the day, if we don't have the ability for activists, for concerned citizens, for leaders in communities to petition their government, what do we have? Well, we have nothing. We have leaders that are then out of touch with the American people. We have people that are taking this country off a cliff and forgetting who sent them there in the first place. And so what we've learned with the election integrity model is that this actually can be the model for state activism. It can be the way you take the inside-outside approach of working with your federal lawmaker and you apply it to your governor. You apply it to your state lawmaker. You actually learn that the same activist that shows up and volunteers as a poll worker or a poll watcher is the same mom that's worried about what her kids are learning in school that's filling up the family van for with five and a half dollars worth of gas. The same people that make this country tick are the same people that care deeply about their elections. So whether you fit in on the training side, the money side, the litigation side, the legislative side, we all have a part to play. And that's what I would leave you with. This is a beautiful conference. These are beautiful ideas that have been discussed over three days. But at the end of the day, the rubber has to meet the road. And we have to have a practical application 
at, at, as, as far as our civic engagement goes. And if we are not willing to show up and volunteer and serve as a poll worker, a watcher, a block walker, talk to our neighbors about who they're voting for, ask them if they need a ride, ask them if they've requested all of their forms, do they have their ID, are they ready to go? If we are not the ones doing that, others are. And so if we really want to be serious about organizing our communities and restoring civic engagement, it starts with getting involved in our election. So I implore you, next time, NatCon, you're going to send a tweet, you're going to write a paper, you're going to write a blog, you're going to comment for an article about some public policy position that needs to turn in a different direction. Stop and think and say, have I talked to my neighbors about their election day voting plans in 55 days? Have I gotten my ducks in a row to go volunteer for two weeks through early voting? Am I prepared to use my law degree the day after the election to help fight any lawsuit that might be needed pro bono for two weeks with Christian? These are the types of things that we need from every single corner of the conservative coalition if we're ever gonna get serious about election integrity. So thank you all for listening to us and I think we'll take some questions.